Can the suffering and death of Jesus Christ on the cross, which happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, be present to us today? The Catholic Church answers yes. Even though the historical moment of the passion of Jesus is in the past, it is made present to us not only in our memories, not only when we read about it in Scripture, and not only when the grace of Christ is given to us, above all, Jesus himself left us a special way in which his passion is made present to us today and becomes effective in us. It's in the sacraments, and above all, in the sacrament of his passion, which is the Eucharist. He instituted the Eucharist with his disciples at the Last Supper, the night before his crucifixion, and when he did so, he told them, do this in memory of me. And the church has been following this command of the Lord ever since in the Mass, which is the celebration of the Eucharist. St. Thomas Aquinas has something magnificent to say about this. He writes in his Summa Theologiae that the Eucharist, quote, works in man the effect which Christ's passion wrought in the world. But what does this mean? In order to understand how St. Thomas Aquinas and the Catholic Church more generally thinks about this, it's important to remember that the Eucharist is a sacrament. A sacrament is a holy sign that causes what it signifies. That is, it causes what it points to and represents. And in fact, a sacrament causes through signifying. In this sacramental way of thinking, because the Eucharist signifies sacramentally the passion of Christ, it therefore makes the sacrifice of Christ present to us in a sacramental mode and works its effect in us. Let's unpack that. Think of what happens at the celebration of the Eucharist. A priest takes bread and wine and pronounces over them the very same words that Jesus used at the Last Supper. This is my body. This is the chalice of my blood. Do this in memory of me. The Last Supper is explicitly the model for what happens at Mass. We're doing what Jesus told us to do. In order to understand this, we should go back to the Last Supper and its rich symbolism. Jesus gathered his disciples for a special Passover meal. It was the evening before his death. And of course, in the background is the Jewish feast of Passover, which itself harkens back to the commands God gave to Moses when he brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. We read about this in chapter 12 of the book of Exodus. God commands Moses that each family must select an unblemished male lamb free of defects. Then they are to sacrifice the lamb and collect its blood in order to put its blood on the doorposts and lintels of each of their houses. The Old Testament has a lot to say about the importance of the blood in any sacrifice, and especially this one. The blood represents the life of the animal and it's the key component in a sacrifice. Much later, after the temple is built in Jerusalem, the Passover sacrifice calls for a Jewish priest to take the blood from the slaughtered lamb and to pour it out on the altar of sacrifice in the temple. But there's another key element in the Passover meal. Each member of the family must eat the roasted flesh of the lamb, along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This eating of the lamb is crucial and it helps us to understand the wider context in the Old Testament, and in fact in many other ancient religious traditions, for a sacrifice like this. It was important for ancient religions not only to slaughter an animal in sacrifice, but that those who were to share in the sacrifice needed to eat a portion of the roasted flesh in a ritual meal. And this is what the Passover meal was accomplishing for the Israelites. It signified that they were the inheritors of the covenant promises of God. So to sum up, the Passover had several key elements. The sacrificial death of an unblemished lamb, the anointing of homes with the blood of the lamb, and the eating of the flesh of the lamb. Now, at the Last Supper, which is a Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus institutes a new covenant. He takes bread and wine and changes it by his divine power into his body and his blood. And with the chalice, he says, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is reconfiguring 
all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament, and especially of the Passover, the most important sacrifice, around himself. He's establishing a new covenant in his blood, and that calls for a new sacrifice and a new ritual sacrificial meal. Do this in memory of me, he says. It's also clear that Jesus is speaking about what he's doing at the Last Supper as an anticipation of what he's about to do on the cross. It's a sacrifice in his blood. He thinks it's the same sacrifice as the cross. He offers that sacrifice at the Last Supper in an unbloody and sacramental mode under the appearances of bread and wine, and then he offers the very same sacrifice a few hours later in a bloody mode on the cross. This means that when we celebrate Mass according to the command of the Lord, we are making present again in a sacramental mode precisely what Jesus did at the Last Supper and therefore at the cross. He is offering the sacrifice of his body and blood to the Father for the salvation of the world. In other words, the Mass is simply extending this sacramental mode into the present for us so that we can receive it in the Eucharist. And this is why Aquinas says that the whole effect of the passion for the world is the same as the effect of the Eucharist in us when we receive it. And our sacramental eating and drinking of the Eucharist is our participation in this Paschal Feast, this feast that celebrates the new covenant instituted by Jesus in a way that echoes and fulfills the ancient Passover sacrifice and ritual meal. In this, we see how wonderfully God provides for his children. He did so in a supreme way at the moment when Christ offered himself on the cross, and that sacrifice is sacramentally made present to us through time whenever the Mass is celebrated. And what is more, the effects of Christ's passion, that is, the salvation of the world, the reconciliation of sinners, the pouring out of the love of Christ, and the gift of all his merits, all of this is applied to each person who receives the Eucharist worthily. Notice how this is just like the Passover. In order to share in the covenant, in order to participate in the sacrifice, you need to eat the Passover lamb. You have to put its blood on your doors. That is, it must mark your lips. For the Christian, of course, all of this begins with baptism. You're baptized into Christ's death and thus into his resurrection. But it reaches its full perfection in the Eucharist as you share most fully in the power of his blood poured out for the remission of your sins and in his body, which is given up for you. Indeed, when you eat his flesh and drink his blood, he comes to dwell in you and makes you a member of himself. For readings, podcasts, and more videos like this, go to Aquinas101.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for one of our free video courses on Aquinas. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share with your friends because it matters what you think. <laughs>